You're listening to the Winter Hughes Podcast with Joe and Eric Hughes. And now, here's the Hughes Brothers. Welcome to a new Winter Hughes Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Hughes, alongside my brother, Eric Hughes. New episodes debut every week. You can always find us on YouTube at Win or Hughes. You can find me on social media at Vegas Joe Hughes. A lot of focus on the A's this week, Rick. I know you got a chance to go out to the game uh, earlier this week. And what's the vibe like at the Coliseum as we're coming into this final homestand for the A's? You know, the team has been playing better as of late, but it's also kind of got that overarching cloud of what's happening with a potential move to Vegas. So when you go to this final homestand, is it a sorrowful mood? Like, how are people feeling when you're, you're kind of in that area and just walking around the Coliseum? It's hard to tell what the vibe is. I, I think a lot of A's fans are still upset. Um, I think news came out that they set a deadline for when they need to to make this vote, the owners to make that vote. So there's still always news coming out about Vegas that no matter how shiny it starts to get on, on the field, it's already lost its luster, you know? So I think there's there's still a lot of upset. And then to be honest, you know, they got swept by the Padres. So then even when you go out there it, and you're losing again, you know? So it's always great to see Bob Melvin. I think Ace fans love Bob Melvin. I think a lot of people did want to go out and see that star-studded lineup. We got to see Fernando Tatis. We got to see Juan Soto and it was exciting. There was some good baseball. Got I had a great seat for Geloff's bomb on the Saturday game, and just the, the where I was sitting, you know, when they put the little stat tracker on when you're watching on TV, that little yellow arc and everything. I got yeah. to appreciate everything. I saw the flight, the takeoff, like <laughs> out where it peaked before it came down. I had just a perfect seat for that, and so you know, uh, appreciating those little small pieces, you know, knowing that. We've got what looks like a, a star player by by all means at this point, and being able to appreciate those small things. So how are other A's fans going? I, I think is still on an individual level. What's the collective vibe? You know, it it's the same. When we get to hear celebration at the end of the game, everybody's happy. And when you don't, it's uh you know, it's a bit of it's a bummer. day that ends in Y, that's you know, it, the way things it. come for the A's this year. And, you know, I was just kind of curious about how things are going because I was trying to pick what will be my last game this season, and I might go on Tuesday for the dog day with a friend and take my daughter with me, but I, I did see somebody on Reddit kind of post that they thought this might be their last A's game ever. Wow. They live outside of the Bay Area. They came back, but they're just not sure what's going to happen with next year and if they're going to go at all or if they're done with it. And it was kind of a sorrowful post. The vibe was like visiting somebody in the hospital for the final time. You know, that like they're not going to have a long time and you're just going to say goodbye. And they said that they went, they walked around the Coliseum. They didn't watch as much of the game and they weren't focused on the on field thing as much as they were just trying to like have those memories and just kind of walk through the Coliseum, through the concourses, sit in different sections for one final time. Yeah, I understand that. And that kind of sounds like that was somebody that went uh, with, with like the intentionality of, of really experiencing it. And I'll be honest, like when I went yesterday, I got a bunch of comp tickets from my local library. And so I had said, hey, yeah, we're you going can read. No, you don't need to be able to read to get a library card. <laughs> That's one of the beautiful things about the community library. Books on tape. Get your library card today. Uh, I guess. So anyway, uh, I got a bunch of comp tickets. So I told the whole family that we're, we're going to go or pick some games. Everybody wanted to go to the Padres. So I'm trying to put these comp things in there. It's not working. It's not working. I'm trying my app and I go on the computer and all this stuff, it's not working. Finally read the fine print. It expires in August. <laughs> so mm. luckily I did have two other comp tickets from like a check-in on MLB, the, the ballpark app. So I used those, got a couple of tickets there to save on the $12 per ticket service fee. Once the kids knew they were going, they were just, we're going, we're going. And they had some other things to do in the morning. And my son is like crying because he wants to wear his A shirt. And so I was like, no, we're doing that later on. But going back to that reverse boycott, when we were talking about some of the highs in the last podcast, like that was one of the highs is my kid's experience at that reverse boycott of, of seeing that huge collective stadium, the feel of everyone, like everyone just like sell the team, sell the team. 
that really got them bought in, you know, and that was something like we got to experience in high school, li- being lucky enough to live on a BART line and, and take BART, go to stadiums when we were, you know, sophomores and juniors and all the way throughout. And just having those experience, going to games that were selling out and, and seeing really good baseball and seeing the huge fan base that Oakland has. And when they come together and get that Coliseum roaring and experiencing that. So my kids got that experience. They were so bought in. That's why I had to go because I already said we were going. But honestly, as soon as I saw the comp tickets were expired, I wouldn't have gone. But <laughs> The kids wanted to go. So I did think yesterday, though, that it was probably going to be my last game of the season. I didn't go into that with the intentional feeling of like, hey, really experience this. This could be the end. I just kind of thought, ah, this is the last one for the season. And, and I'm making the assumption that I will go back next season. If that did turn out to be my last game and I didn't get to have that intentional experience, I think it would be a, a little bit like, oh, I'll, I'll go visit them in the hospital tomorrow. And then, and then they kind of check out. So I thought that was an interesting way that you put it. But one of the things I was thinking about yesterday with being there with the kids and watching literally like four pitches. There are so many different parts of the Coliseum to experience. So I was thinking, like, what what is your favorite area when when you get dragged away from the the main attraction on the field? Where do you like to find yourself at the Coliseum? Well, that's a good question, man. We've had the pleasure of sitting in a lot of different areas. Hey, I've had the press pass, so I've been able to go all over. But you and I have sat in the MVP section right behind home plate. We sat right behind the dugout, and then you know, like all A's fans, you start with the cheapest ticket you can get. And you just work your way to a better seat, which we used to do, especially in high school, before the ushers really started kind of cracking down on that. For this whatever year. There's, reason. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I don't know, man. I've, I've always really enjoyed the second deck along the third baseline. I think you get a good view there. You get a chance for foul balls. Uh, I've always kind of enjoyed that area right there. Plus, you're on the A side of the field. Obviously, sitting right behind the dugout is the coolest experience. I also liked when you and I have had a chance to sit near the bullpen right behind it. I remember Justin Dukesher throwing back to PCL pitcher of the year, Justin Dukesher, and just watching the curve on his curveball, which was a very impressive 12 to 6 curveball, just gives you really appreciation for how incredible. I think you and I were watching like, how is somebody supposed to hit that? Because it looked like a wiffle ball the way that he could throw it. The Coliseum overall, I mean, it's always got this kind of perception as the last dive bar. I think one of the beauties of that is you do have a different experience wherever you get to sit in the Coliseum. Like if you want to get together with your friends, you can go right now to what used to be just the bleachers, but now you can go to different areas like the treehouse. You and I have kids now. We can go to that kids section so that even though like you and I have joked before is like we've gone to games where we've gotten blacked out drunk. And I remember more of going to that game than I do for most games I get to go with my kids because you're distracted. But now with that kid zone, we do get to watch a little bit of the game and we do get to watch the kids run around. Like even earlier this season, Jesus Aguilar had an incredible battle that ended with a home run. And I remember getting to watch that at the Coliseum. And the only reason I was able to focus on that was because my kids were running around at the kid zone. So there's so many cool things to be able to do. You can kind of pick your own adventure for what you want to do at the Coliseum, which this was years ago, but I remember Yahoo Sports did a list of like the best feature of every part of the ballpark. And when they got to the Oakland Coliseum, they only wrote one sentence. It was that you can do whatever you want to do at the Oakland Coliseum. I'm somebody that it's it's tough for me to watch movies and there's so many movies that people like have just completely expected me to have watched and they're like, oh, but you know, you've seen it and I, I just haven't seen it. And honestly, to watch a movie takes me like three or four days. I fall asleep. I'll watch it again <laughs> the next day. Um, the way that they kind of make series now, so you like binge it or whatever, it, it kind of works a little better for me. Watch it, pause. But it, I just can't sit and, and do that. And that's one of the things I love about the Coliseum is I just do so many different things. It, going to games and never going to my the, the seat that is on the yeah. ticket that I purchased yeah. and just experiencing so many different parts from the, the treehouse to Shy Park, Championship Plaza, sneaking down or a friend is sitting somewhere. Hey, come visit me over here. As far as watching baseball goes, I'm with you. I, I really like the second deck along the third baseline there. 
I do think the third deck is a little underappreciated because, you know, it was kind of like what we had to have <laughs> in high school because those were the cheapest ones. $8 yeah. tickets, oh, baby. man, you can't beat it. It's Wednesday. Let's go. You know, that's kind of what you, you've always got. But, you know, every now and then I'll just kind of sneak up and take a view and you can just get yeah. such a nice view up there. You know, I, I'm with you sitting below the dugout or right by the dugout is just an incredible experience. And I, I've been there a few times with my kids where my kids are are talking to the ace players that are on deck or in the hole. And I, I've even said the first time was with my oldest and she was talking to uh, Chris Davis and she was like, hey, crush, go get him. And I said, he can't talk to you. He's got to focus on the game. And literally, as soon as I said that, he turned around and waved to her. My wife and I, <laughs> both of us, our jaws dropped and we like way back. And then just recently we were over there and uh, my son was going, no, da, no, da. And then uh, yeah. turned around, played a little peekaboo with him. And then went out, crushed a double. It was great. I know. I mean, you know, you, you bring that up and it brings up a good point because it's it's something we talked about early on in this podcast, right after the A's uh, announced their move to Vegas earlier this season is like, what do you do as a parent? Because these are the interactions like you're talking about with that KD moment that help instill fandom in like our kids, which are young. Like my daughter is going to be six in a month and she uh, is asking me about going to A's games and wanting to have that experience because the reverse boycott is fun. She goes with her cousins, they hang out, they do the let's go Oakland chant, they do the clap, they do all these things that bond generations of fans that you and I do and that we've been able to pass on to our kids. But with that looming cloud, it is a little kind of concerning for me how much I want to continue that experience and invest in having that thing together because I want it. I want those pictures. I want those memories together, even if the team does leave and go to Vegas. But I also don't want my daughter to have this thing that she comes to love and then it's gone. You know, I don't want to like be like, oh, enjoy this puppy while it lasts. How are you feeling about that? I know you were saying that this might be your last game, but it does kind of leave me some questions just in as not just a fan, but as a parent and a fan. No, I, I hear you. I, I'm just another A's fan that has had the same experiences as all A's fans dealing with this news and, and um, having my own emotions and, and considering like, well, what does this mean for me? Do I want to spend my money? So John Fisher gets this money and, and in the long haul and, you know, I'm also someone that's experiencing increased prices. You know, I'm also somebody that's experiencing my favorite players getting traded away and getting replaced with veterans that aren't meeting the grade, you know, and luckily they've moved some of those guys on. <laughs> and I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm not, not going to Just... say it. And, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I've, I've said it enough. Um, but <laughs> yeah, no, I've had all those experiences. And I, I think I'm somebody that also kind of thought, hey, maybe this is my last game. If there's a business that is disappointing me, I'm not somebody that's going to like continue to give you my business. But then I've got kids, you know, and so that's the other side. And just like you're saying, so the other piece that I'm thinking of is like not getting too far ahead of myself, right? Like the A's right now are still here. My kids do want to go to that. I guess it's a bridge that we'll cross when that bridge comes up. But right now we're we're just enjoying it. The journey. It's a bridge too far it right is, now. It it's is. A bridge you know, and I'm right now I'm like, be quiet in the back seat, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> no, no, yeah. uh, we're just enjoying the ride. You know, we had a great time yesterday we, and we try and really have the experience. You know, we bring peanuts, seeds, get some Cracker Jacks and, and all that and really enjoy yeah. the take me out to the ball game. One thing I did want to do was get a video of uh, my whole family singing take me out to the ball game at the A's. And that is something that I, I do still hope to do. So I am hopeful that it isn't my last game ever, but it could be the last one this season. Maybe not. My oldest really wants to get that Ruiz t-shirt. You know, I was thinking <laughs> if, if I do go, and I know everyone jokes about, you know, bringing their tools and stealing seats and everything like that, which will be readily available mm -hmm. whenever the Coliseum is done with its mm -hmm. uh, actual, you know, sustainable life. But I was definitely thinking about maybe trying to steal some of that ice plant from around the stadium, mm. I've got a couple of those like small plastic helmets, like the ones they used to do ice cream in, the ones they do nachos in now, and maybe plant some dirt in there and then put that ice plant that has been around the Coliseum for a long time in that. And then it's something you could have in your office, kind of upside down 
as like a little planner box. So maybe that's what I'm thinking about doing in my last game. Or I'll just get the ice plant legally. Maybe. Yeah, I was going to say, any crimes you commit after uh, planning on a a (laughs) podcast makes them premeditated. So that's just going to make it a little more severe. I mean, if you want to see them, that's the best part. You can get away with whatever you want to do. There are thousands of seats in the parking lot. Just walk on over and yeah. take whatever you want. I'm sure they would be very happy to have you help. Well, you mentioned that you uh, had a great view of Zach Geloff's homer at the game you went to this weekend. And, you know, we've been talking about it. The BG and AG, before Geloff and after Geloff. So even when the A's are losing these games, Geloff is still doing something that gives you optimism and provides a spark to keep watching. He's played 55 games as we tape this podcast today. He is already just behind Ryan Noda as the second most valuable player on this A's team for wins above replacement. Obviously, low bar, worst A's team that we've seen in a long, long time. They've already matched the loss total from last year, back-to-back 100 loss seasons. But Zach Geloff in just 55 games, less than a third of a regular season, is proving to be a star level player. If that plays out over the regular season, great. But you're talking about those young players. We loved Ryan Noda. We loved Estuary Ruiz. Zach Geloff is even looking like he's going to be on a much higher level than those other promising rookies we talked about. Yeah, by all appearances, he he's a generational talent. And not only do the stats show that, but the intangibles of, of being able to step up in big moments when it does matter. And he just kind of seems like he's got that that short memory, right? Like we've talked about that. Like he he is still a rookie. If he if he makes an error on the on the field, he shakes it off. If he steps up to the plate, 0 for 2, 0 for 3, that doesn't matter to him. He's locked and loaded. And I just love his stance. He just looks like he has so much power ready to unload there so no it's it's been great and uh yeah absolutely looks like a generational talent um and i really hope that you know not too many expectations can get put on him like that he doesn't feel that he needs to individually carry a club because it is a team game and and one player can only do so much but i think one of the things that he is able to do is provide a spark in other players because you know He's not a guy that's like coming and going like, I'm doing it. You need to pick it up. He's coming in and he's having fun. And and when you, you're you having fun doing it, other guys are going to have fun around you. He, he's not leading like, you should be at my level and the rest of you aren't at my level. And, and hopefully, you know, he stays level-headed through his development and, 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 you know, that doesn't become a thing. And he's able to continue to spark some of the best out of his I teammates. think it becomes difficult when you're watching a really bad team. And these are a little bit different, right? They, they had the 12 and 50 start and that most of that team is gone. It's kind of gone into this youth movement. But when you're watching a really bad team, it does get hard to compare how good a player is versus how bad the team is. So if you took a guy like Ryan Noda and Estuary Ruiz, who have really stood out on this A's team, and you put them on a good you know, team around baseball, pick at any team that's going to be in the playoffs, would they just be kind of like, oh, that's cool, good for them, they're they're looking good. But they would be smaller, you know, they'd be down the rosters, like how you'd notice them. And I think that's one of those differences is Zach Geloff would still be a standout, I feel, on a good team. Because he's going to be that next tier of player that actually gets you excited to go watch an A's game at the Coliseum. Whereas I'm really excited to watch Estuary Ruiz get on base. I really like what Ryan Nota's done. But the guy that's going to get me to want to come out is going to be a guy like Zach Geloff. And I feel like there's a difference there when you're looking around baseball as that marketability to be excited to go watch somebody. I absolutely agree with you. You know, I, I think like one of the big things is like you know you see some other guys come up to the play 0 for 2 or 0 for 3 you just kind of assume it's going to be 0 for 4 now and uh you just let let's just side retired let's change sides here um when zach eloff comes up even if he's having an off night you still feel like something could happen and i hear what you're saying it's like okay if mike trout came over would he slide right into the starting lineup or would he be on the bench well obviously mike trout would be, be on the aisle lineup right <laughs> right yeah but it, it, if you took um zach geloff and you 
did the same thing and you moved him to a bunch of those teams, yeah, a lot of those teams, he would be the starter. If not, he'd be the first guy coming off the bench and, hey, maybe even in a, in a tough spot, like, hey, we need a pinch hit right here, even though he's a rookie, because he kind of just shows like, hey, I'm out here playing baseball. I'm out Yeah, here. it looks like a young guy taking a leadership role just through his actions, just through going about his business and playing. People want to follow him. Not one of these things where he kind of comes in and determines, I want to be a leader. I want to be that guy that you guys all turn to. He's like, no, I'm just going to go about my business. And people gravitate towards that. They want to be around. It's been fun watching some of the transitions we've talked about this season. And Ken Waldachuk is going to get another start right now. But he's a guy that I'm really high on. And we talked about how he closed last year, came into this season. He had a 7.46 ERA in 12 games, 10 starts in April and May. Terrible. You know, it was really rough for a guy that the A's were hoping was going to take a big leap. And he went to the bullpen. The A's worked him out of that bullpen into a starting role. And the results since then have been very good. He started working on his changeup, but he's got a 3.58 ERA in 10 starts since April and May. 3.58 is very good for a left-handed pitcher that you're really high on in his first full season. And that's the other way to judge this is, how are these guys growing? Ken Waldachuk, his first full big league season. Shea Langoliers, his first big league season. Even a guy like Brent Rooker, who's been around a little bit, getting to 25 homers in his first big league season. So is there anybody that you've seen this year, besides you know Zach Geloff, who's the obvious candidate, that seems to you like next year, if you're invested in this team, is ready for a leap? is ready to take a big jump forward and be a more consistent guy rather than like, man, that guy is still growing. He's developing. Obviously, they are, but who's ready to take a leap in your eyes? Well, I hope it's Jordan Diaz. I guess that would be my hope because, you know, he has so much potential and he has shown a lot of development with his glove. Um, He does still show sometimes where you're like, okay, he's going to make this one. And then it hits him in the heel of the glove. And, and, you know, you're a little bit like, come (laughs) on, man, you got to make that play. Um, But then he comes up hits a bomb and totally yeah, redeems yeah. himself, right? And so you you want to see some consistency from him, and that's a position that still has some question marks. So that's the position that I guess I would say I'm hopeful, and that's the person I'm hopeful makes that leap. For Waldachuk, I, I agree that he has made a lot of growth too. I think it goes with the team as well, right? The whole team was struggling when Waldachuk was struggling. And there was a lot of still dead weight that the A's have, you know, shown, hey, we're going to move on and we're going to replace that with some younger guys. I think Sears is hopefully going to adjust to the workload and see that, hey, this franchise believes in you and they're going to give you a lot of work to go do. I'm glad that so many of these rookies are getting an extended opportunity. We saw Shea Langoliers at the end of last season. We saw Ken Waldachuk and J.P. Sears get run in that final like month, month and a half of the regular season last year. But that just wasn't enough time for them to really kind of get their feet wet. The guy that's getting that kind of experience right now is Lawrence Butler and Tyler Soderstrom. And you're hoping that they're going to be able to be a big part of next year too. But I'm glad so many A's are getting to that experience level that next year you do feel like it won't be as dreadful. Not necessarily they're going to make a leap to playoff contender right away. It's just not going to be that 12 and 50 dregs that we saw at the beginning of this year. The expectation with this year was finding the pieces that would start to be the core. And I think now we have that, right? So I think there are people that you're going to expect to see out there starting next year where so many of it was a question mark this year. And a lot of those guys who got that job aren't around. So I do think we can expect that we'll see Butler. I think we can expect that we'll see Ruiz, Noda. You know, Noda was a question mark. I think he's answered that question. I think we're definitely going to see Geloff, Langoliers. So a lot of those questions have been answered. Hopefully Nick Allen and, and Jordan Diaz can really answer that question on their own and go, hey, Look no further where where you're going. I love so, that infield defense um, with Geloff and Allen. It looks so smooth right now, the way that those two guys are playing up the middle for the A's. I really, really enjoy just kind of watching that part get solidified and just not have to be like, all right, here we go. Let's see what's going to happen. It's just like, they got it. I'm, I'm feeling confident with it. You know, last season, there were times it was laughable where literally there's two outs and balls would drop, right? Just from communication errors. 
and just basic plays couldn't be made. And so now there are basic plays being made and there are beyond uh, basic plays being made and there are highlight reel plays being made. So now instead of just going like, okay, it's a pop up, that guy yeah. better keep running because he's going to make it to third. Uh, you know, you're like, okay, here we go. And we got to dig out. There's a double play. So no, I, I think next year going into it there, there is more of a core. Hopefully Mason Miller is going to be ready to go. And I think a lot of people would believe that he would be the guy that could get a nod to go out and start the season for us. So what about you? What are your thoughts from what you've seen from this year and, and what your hope is for for next season. I think you covered it really well. I mean, like you said, it's about getting that core together and coming into next season with a pitching staff. Like you think back to the starters that were expected to be this year on the pitching staff. They were hoping that Paul Blackburn was going to be there, but he started on the IL. Drew Rosinski, we hardly knew ye. And then, you know, Shin Taro Fujinami, you look at, you know, all of these guys that were supposed to be there, almost none of them are there. The only guy that's left is JP Sears from that original intended starting rotation. And now you're coming into a year next year where you're like, okay, Paul Blackburn likely to be back unless he's moved to this off season, leading that rotation, providing that veteran stability that they want. And then after that, it looks so much deeper with guys that we've actually seen cut their teeth at the big league level. JP Sears, he's hitting an inning limit that he's never done before. And that's part of what his growth is, is the A's want him to stretch out and be able to handle that kind of workload because they really like him. And for a long stretch, he was maybe the A's most consistent starting pitcher. Then you follow that up with guys that have high upside, like you talked about, Mason Miller, Ken Waldachuk, Luis Medina. And all of a sudden you're like, well, where's James Caprillion going to fit in? Is he going to have to be a reliever if he's still going to be here? There are so many guys that are still coming up through the A system that they have high upside for the pitching that it looks like that's the next part to marry to what you talked about with that core of Shea Langelier, Zach Geloff, maybe Tyler Sotis from Jordan Diaz, Nick Allen, Lawrence Butler, Estuary Ruiz, Ryan Noda, goes on and on and on. Then all of a sudden you're like, man, this is a team I would watch. I would pay money to go watch that team first. You know, like I don't have a library comp ticket, so I'm just going to watch on TV. There you go. Now, I one of the things I've really enjoyed about this season is getting those young guys out there. And like Medina yesterday, to get an opportunity to go against Juan Soto. And, you know, it didn't always go the way that he wanted it to go. But that's going to be a lot better for your development than guys that you're going to be facing in AAA in a season when it doesn't matter. Yeah, it does not matter. There is nothing you're playing for but experience and development right now. So why not go against the best? I'm really excited for them to, you know, cut their teeth at this level and, and get this learning experience and, and to really get a whole complete season with now a much more solid foundation. And so if you do want to go add a veteran here or there, you know, and spend a little money to maybe plug some holes. I don't think it's going to be as upsetting to A's fans when, you know, you are bringing in some guys and you're like, what are you bringing these guys in for? To plug some holes. Yeah, right. There's too many holes. Yeah. And like, okay, they're not even plugging their holes. They're soaking right through. So I think it's a lot more exciting for what the potential could be baseball-wise. There's still that looming cloud of Las Vegas that that brings some rain over that for a lot of A's fans. And you brought it up earlier was that the owners have set November as the the deadline for when they're going to have a relocation vote. And there's this thing in news and, you know, in media that's called take out the trash day. Usually people would put their bad news out on Friday right before the weekend because that's when no one's going to be paying attention to it. And November is that for baseball. It's after the World Series has ended. You've got NBA getting ramped up. You've got NFL in full swing. So people aren't paying attention to baseball and it's before you get into like the off season program. So you kind of dump your news there. You maybe take a bad hit for a day or two, but no one's going to be talking about it. And then you can kind of get into your off season program. So it's kind of concerning for me just on when they've scheduled this, that feels like a little bit of an inevitability. You do still have the potential that that Vegas money could wind up on the ballot next year. What John Fisher needs is that January 15th deadline. He needs a binding deal. The next step is the MLB owners voting to approve Vegas. And then by January 15th, he's got to have that done deal so that he can stay on revenue sharing as he is told in his interviews. And the A's need to stay on revenue sharing for this business to continue the operations the way that they have 
as pathetic as it has been financially, that's just kind of what is on the docket. It, it is a little looming as we talked about some of these positives with these young players. It always feels like as soon as you're like, okay, there's some optimism here, I'm feeling good. And then it's just like one more punch to the gut to be like, don't forget it's going to end poorly. Yeah, and that, you know, going back to your original question, that impacts the vibes for A's players, right? Like, when when you know, like, hey, I already am not a billionaire. This is my hard-earned money, and they're raising... I checked today. My bank account does not have that many commas no, in it. No, mine either. And, uh, yeah, maybe if we put them together, we'll still be short. Uh, but, uh <laughs> yeah, so then you think, yeah, what what do I want to get my hard-earned money for? And then to know that your guy this guy's pretty much going to take your money and go, "Hey, I'm going to use your money to move." It's a little bit upsetting, you know? And so I I do understand A stands that like that guy said that goes, "I'm I'm not going in." And I do wonder like what it will be like, you know, when it is all uh done and dusted if there if it does get to that. But that is a bridge that is down the road that we don't have to cross yet and until that happens, if you got some free tickets, send them my way because my kids would love to get out there. And uh, I, I like the rest of you, don't want to get my hard-earned money over there. This has been the Winner's Use Podcast. New episodes debut every week. You can find us on YouTube, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts at. You can find us at Win or Hughes. You can find me on social media at Vegas Joe Hughes. And we'll talk again next week. Thanks for listening to the Winner Hughes Podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe. 